So I'm looking here at a spindle that has kind of crept up here on the internet lately in the DIY community. And it's a 300 watt spindle. There's 600 watt, etc. I only know the 300 watt version so that my review only covers that. Uh, Inventable sells it among others. Uh, I would say that it is not a very capable spindle. Uh, my first one had some pretty major issues with it and uh, Inventables actually sent me a second one, um, which is this one, which I've also taken apart. Um, there are actually some design flaws in it that I'll try to explain here. So I've kind of taken a lot of this stuff out here already so that it's easy. There's some pins you have to take off. These two screws are here, uh, which I, we'll talk about one of those design issues. Uh, this is a brushed motor, so here are the brushes. There are springs that are normally in here. I have them in a bag somewhere. Uh, and then this guy comes off. Uh, this is actually a lot more solid than I thought it was going to be. Uh, you can actually clamp this, though, tight enough that it will bind. Um, I had uh, some really nice half-inch spaced mounts that are perfectly round. Uh, I could probably dig one up, but it's perfectly round, and they fit, and they flush right in the middle. There's about a 20 mil gap, so they mate. And I can actually tighten it enough that this spindle hits on the wall here, you can see that um, there is only about, you know, 20 mils, which is, of course, the, the magnetism is a uh, exponentially decays as you get away. So you want it to be as close as possible and still work in your design tolerances. In this case, so the metal itself actually deflects enough. It's quite thick. Um, let me grab my caliper here. This is, make sure I'm zeroed, uh, 2.08 millimeters, uh, which uh, is, 0.075 inches maybe. Don't quote me on that. Let's see. Uh, maybe 0.85. You do the math. 25.4. So uh, the first issue I have with this motor here uh, is that it uses radial ball bearings. Um, typically when you have um, a spindle, you want to use angular contact bearings, uh, which actually can take axial loads, which are the loads that actually the spindle when it pushes right like that the bearing is really good at resisting it so you can use deep deep groove ball bearings um, a lot of cheaper spindles do and of course angular contact bearings are a little more expensive because um or they can be a lot more expensive uh, because you have to actually get a matched pair or you have to shim it really well both the inner um, and the outer races need to uh, have a, a gap in it typically like on the in a df you'll you'll shave the inner ring uh, so that it has maybe five mils uh, of difference so that when you screw everything tight together, uh, the bearings are preloaded. If you don't preload them, then all of the backlash you have in, in the bearing system will, uh, of course, appear on your Z axis. So the radial, uh, deep group radial bearings, uh, they're, you know, they're, there's a, a derating factor. I've seen people use them where they put three or four of them in a row. Uh, but they're really designed for radial loads uh, and kind of axial loads. Uh, if you can get the double bearings, then that's fine. Now, one issue here is that the bearings on this system are actually quite far apart here. So one of them is here, and one of them is here. Uh, these are both deep groove again, so they both have backlash. Now, the problem is, is that no matter what you do to get rid of all the preload, which I'm not claiming they have done here, uh, as the motor heats up, which of course here is your metal part that has all the current coming through it, and here's your electromagnetic portion, and of course here are the brushes, this heats up a lot. This spindle gets very hot, just like all spindles do. Um, and so as the rod expands axially as it warms up, no matter how well you preload it when it's cool, when it's warm again, of course, it will uh, get loose. Uh, and I've definitely known that. And again, I'll, you know, if I haven't already, I'll show the clip now, maybe. So that, that is a problem. Uh, typically you want two angular contact bearings in the front as close as you can get them uh, to the end of your spindle. Uh, I, you could put them anywhere along here. You could put them at the very end uh, as long as they're close together so that your delta when the heat expands is much smaller when the metal expands. Um, now the reason you don't put them over here is that typically you can just put a radial bearing on the end so that there's really nothing wrong with this radial bearing here assuming you have two angular contact bearings here in the case. Uh, with this radial bearing here, this can actually move on shaft. You typically don't want to secure it so that as it expands, it can actually just move in here. Now, these guys have not done that. Uh, I'll note that you can buy this spindle on AliExpress for like $35 uh, plus the shipping, which is you know, $25, $30. Bucks. Um, so it's probably cheaper to buy from Chico, and it's not terrible overall. Um, 
it is quite a noisy spindle um, as far as RF noise. Uh, these brushes, you can actually see them already starting to, to warp here. One of the issues is that the, the brush is actually a little bit too small for this application. Um, and I will say this is actually kind of hard to assemble um, with your own tools. There's some little jig that they use probably to assemble it. Uh, you can use a small Allen wrench to do it, but it's really hard to get these brushes to not spring out. Of course, again, I've taken the springs out. You can see the brushes don't actually have a large contact area. It's actually quite small. So they've actually put a really large brush on here, and then they've only used the very end of it, which seems like a waste to me. So major issues, uh, other that, others that I've seen. Uh, if you look here at this bearing here, I noticed that this is not conductive. So um, the spindle tip here, is not conductive to here. Now, if you're using ball bearings, of course, it should be. Um, in this case, it was not. And that was my first clue that there was something going on here. And so what that something is, is actually on these bearings, uh, let's see if I can get it to move here. Uh, they're actually, there's a rubber, um, let me get a screwdriver on this. Sorry, I don't have one handy. Um, that's probably too big, but we'll make it work. So let's take this guy off here. This guy. So we're taking the electric assembly for the brushes off. Um, if you look at this bearing, it's quite fascinating. They're actually using, uh, you know, a decent bearing. It's the um, uh, 608Z, which is again that deep groove bearing. But if you look here, they've actually secured it with a little rubber standoff here. Um, this rubber is actually quite flexible. Um, this piece is not in there that hard. Um, you can see that they just put that in and they push the bearing in. Um, so that gives this bearing a ton of radial play. Um, and when you take it out, and, and again in the video, which maybe I'll show now, um, this this is killing us here. Um, there's of course another one here in the front, um, and this is harder to move, but you can see, just see how I rotate it here, I can push it right back. You can see how that would be a lot of radial play in there. Um, the reason I can't take that off uh, is that the end here on the actual ER11 call it um, is actually heated when they put it on so they actually heat this up to maybe 300 degrees C and that makes it expand and then they can put it on the shaft and as it cools down it grabs on real tight so even though there's two set screws here um, this still will not come off and you know I've tried to hit it out real, real hard you can, of course can't heat it up because the uh, uh, the heat will go right into that and it'll expand about the same so I can't actually take this off now um, this is the all this is fine so far to me um, why would you use this? This is the thing that bothers me here. So these screws basically, they hold onto this case because they crimp in here. So we'll, we'll look at this guy right here. These screws, uh, there's only one spot that it fits, it's notched. These screws basically drop in here. Sorry, oh, it's hitting the magnet, of course. Uh, I'm not gonna do that. Imagine a cylinder, if you will. It screws in here to here. So when we're securing this down, we're basically tightening these guys around this guy, which is, you know, pushing back. So these guys are completely flush. Here. So we have our cylinder, which is this guy right here. And then we have this wall here. And these screws are screwing from here to here, which is threaded. So as we're tightening this down, right, we're securing this guy really, really well to this frame so that it won't move. Now the issue is, is that in no way have we actually engaged our axis here. So what they do is when they assemble it, if this is unclear, it will become clear, right? We have not secured this guy from moving this direction well, at least. So what they've done is they put this little... Uh, snap-on collar and it it goes right against the bearing of course so it's sitting here on our bearing like that and then on this front side they just put uh, snot glue hot glue in the front here it, it might actually be super glue or an epoxy and then they have this little tiny uh, crush like a nylon uh, crush uh, thing that that it will basically take the slack so then what they do is while this glue is still wet uh, they screw it in really, really tight, and that way, this guy right here, so here's our actual shaft, like this, and they intentionally made uh, this polyethylene stick out a little bit here, so if you imagine 
there's a little bit of a delta right there. And that way, as you screw it all down, it just crushes together. Now, that's not a terrible idea when you're designing something that's cheap like this. The problem is that this, this polyethylene tube, this you see it's a white tube right here, it's too long. There's nothing for it to crush into, so it will just continue to crush. You can see right here where it has continued to crush around. So what this means is the only thing that keeps your z-axis from moving once you get this secured, so you, you, you know, the same two screws are securing both your bearings and your entire enclosure together, which is not the correct way to do it. Typically you'd have one set of screws that does your, your bearings, your, your DF configuration right here, uh, and then you have another thing that maybe holds your enclosure around. Um, so what this means is that as this thing wears, and this is over, it's exaggerated, that polyethylene is going to keep pushing down. I'm having a hard time pushing it. And it's just going to keep collapsing. Um, so you'll see that with these spindles. Um, that's a huge thing. And so that's, again, why they put this rubber in here as well, is their, their expectation is that as you screw this tight, this little rubber ring is going to basically resist and get harder and harder push. Now, the flaw with that is that as this pushes, it's only making this part tighter. So it is axially preloading it, you know, until this collapses from overheating or whatever. But you're not actually doing anything at all towards the sidewall here. There's no additional force here. So this sidewall actually stays fairly loose. And, you know, I can take the sidewall here with the caliper, which I've lost even though I haven't moved. Here we go. And if we were to measure the sidewall, let's see, how am I going to do this? Let me fold it up. I'm going to try to measure it here on the flat without getting measurement error. And I have 0.5, so even just very softly here, I'm able to, to bump this down from 0.5 to 0.4 millimeters. Now, I'm probably bending the actual mechanism itself, so here we can push here uh, where I have less leverage. But that's still you know, 0 0.03, which is, which is not, not zero. And of course, as we add a lot of force in here, Man, I can cut that thing all the way down to nothing. Um, so even when I put it in here, see if we can do this properly. I wish I had a drop dial. I can push this, and you could almost feel the rubber uh, bending. And of course, you can see that. It's really exaggerated, too, um, once you get the spindle going in. So. That's a major issue. If that's, if that's unclear, um, I do apologize, but basically, if you're trying to screw two pieces together, one of these is the axle, and one of these is the enclosure, and the enclosure is also over here. If there's any delta difference between these two, one of them's gonna be loose. And no matter which one is loose, say this one's a little bit longer, which of course means this one's a little longer, your axle's going to move back and forth, assuming you've grounded the, the enclosure here, so the enclosure can't move. If the axle is, is longer, so now you've still tightened it, well now this whole assembly still moves, you know, this guy's still grounded, and, and it still moves, so you have to take that up. And again, they've, they've tried to lessen that by putting a rubber washer in here, which insulates the whole thing, which actually makes the thing noisier um, because you have a lot of noise that's not grounded coming out the front of your spindle. Uh, this basically becomes an RF antenna for all of the EMI on these guys. Now this is a very wide band because it's a brushed motor. Uh, and that antenna, man, it radiates right out the back, it radiates right out the front. So if you see a lot of noise issues with thing, this thing, that's because, well, this thing's not grounded. It's a perfectly isolated antenna. Uh, it's about what? five and a half inches long, so man, it's, it is a perfect antenna for, for the noise that, that can be killing your system. Um, I actually found that if you um, put a commutator on this, uh, I actually 3D printed a commutator that fits right here, and then I can ground that commutator. Uh, you can actually see the, the marks, maybe, maybe you can't. Uh, because this is now grounded, your EMI goes way, way lower, and, and I used to just near field probing with a little coax cable on a one gigahertz scope, it does a huge, huge difference. Um, so overall, I do not recommend this spindle. Uh, it's cheap, it's enticing, but it is, it is poorly, poorly designed. There, there are some really critical flaws in it. 
Now, how would you fix these flaws? You know, you say, don't complain if you don't have a solution. Well, it's actually quite simple. Um, the three things I would do is, one, I would put two bearings here uh, that are basically angular contact. Um, or, barring that, um, I would put uh, at least two radial uh, deep groove bearings here, and then I would secure them uh, via a, a thread on this. Uh, this is an 8 millimeter diameter, and that way any expansion you have out here doesn't matter because it, this is now grounded. This is grounded to that. This can move as far as you want it to. It's not, you know, it doesn't move that far, of course, um, and there's no additional issues with that. Um, so I would certainly put two bearings in the front, still leave the bearing in the back so the motor itself does not start wobbling eccentrically as it's turning, because it's you know, 10,000 RPM, it would do that, so you need a radial bearing in the back. Um, but a simpler way, assuming you're gonna keep the, the bearing on the front and the back and just say, you know, screw it, I don't care about the, the thermal expansion, um, you could put a two, a two sets of screw mechanism on here. Uh, one set would basically hold this guy sideways into here and you would tighten it first. Uh, and that way this guy is, is completely secured into the enclosure here. 